if the courts rule against her, they would accept that. They would say, yes, the power lands in the, highs, lands in the, uh, lands in the hands of the UK government. But if the court rules in their favour, there's very, very little that Boris Johnson could do to stop Scotland having its say for its future. So in this election, Tom, the people of Scotland have had their say. But what happens next could be decided in the courts. This isn't happening anytime soon. Nicola Sturgeon's clear it's after the pandemic. So we're looking at two, three years down the line, but we are on course for a collision. Now, thank you very much indeed. Well, joining me once again tonight are our ITV News election analysts. Uh, here with me in Edinburgh is Professor Jane Green from Nuffield College, Oxford, and co-director of the British Election Study. And at his home in North Yorkshire is Professor Colin Rallings, our ITV News election analyst. I'm sure both more than familiar with you all by now. Colin, can I come to you first? Um, how does that, I mean, just looking at what's happened today and what we've seen so far, and maybe just casting forward, as Nicola Sturgeon was doing, to the possibility of that referendum, what is it telling you about the pattern of votes and how things might go? Well, Tom, there's a saying in politics, as indeed in other aspects of life, don't ask a question unless you know what the answer's going to be. And both Alex Salmon in 2014 and David Cameron in 2016 asked a question of the electorate and they got the answer that they didn't want. And Nicola Sturgeon, it's always been assumed we want a solid pro-independence majority in the polls, not simply at an election, something like 55-45 in favour of independence, going on for some months before she would feel confident in calling that referendum. And things have got more complicated since 2014 because of Brexit, of course, because there are now questions about the relationship of an independent Scotland with the rest of the, the UK, uh, questions of tariff barriers, what's been happening in Northern Ireland, the EU itself, uh, the EU are very unkeen on letting Catalonia become an independent part away from Spain. There may be similar considerations with Scotland and the United Kingdom. So I think it's not easy, even if she has that pro-independence majority, not an independent, not a majority of our own, but a pro-independence majority in Holyrood. Okay, Colin, for now, thank you very much indeed. We'll come back to you in a moment to talk about England. Jane, can I put that to you? I mean, Colin essentially saying there, she's, you know, it's tight, it looks tight, but she doesn't have a solid pro-independence majority. What does she need to do, do you think, to get this over the line for her supporters? So it seems to me today, Tom, that the results are really showing this kind of solid independence block of votes and this solid pro-union block of votes. And that's very similar to what we've seen since 2014. We've seen this kind of real polarisation in Scotland. And so it's very unlikely that Nicola Sturgeon can persuade hard and died in the wall independent supporters you know, that, that, that they're not going to be persuaded any further, oh, that she's very unlikely to persuade very strong pro-union voters mm. to her cause. So she has to go for the people in the middle, and she has to convince them mm. around the costs and the benefits, and also allay the fears and the risks mm. of an independent Scotland as a member of the European Union, potentially. Mm. And that hangs on her ability to govern well as a, in the SNP and government, it hangs on what the UK government does, the spending... I hope Prowse is safe and luck. ...to convince those voters that it's disadvantageous what the UK is able to provide to Scotland and how Boris Johnson responds to that. And as Colin was saying, there's that massive question, and it really is... Seeing more detail on this one. ...as a member of the European Union. But I don't show it on camera. ...and really has to shift decisively in a pro-independent... That one looks brighter on camera. ...conceivable and risk-free for Nicola Sturgeon. England in a moment, but uh, Scotland side, the election stuff, Super Thursday, have given Boris a fantastic Friday. Across England, the Tories have picked up council seats, but it was Hartlepool's by-election which delivered the most significant result. It's a, a seat Labour has held, of course, since its creation in 1974, and Keir Starmer was desperate to hold it. In the end, though, it wasn't even close, as another brick of the so-called Red Wall was painted blue. All pumped up, both the balloon Boris Johnson and the real thing. After the Tories' historic victory in the Hartlepool by-election and their gains in council votes all over England. It's a mandate for us to continue to, to deliver, uh, for not just for the people of Hartlepool, not just the people of the, of the North East, but across the whole of the, of the country. Sir Keir Starmer took Labour's helm after his party's 2019 general election flop. It's worse since 1935. He hasn't stopped the rot. We have lost four general elections in a row. We've been bitterly disappointed results 
last night. This goes way beyond the reshuffle, goes way beyond personalities. It goes to the core issue of whether the Labour Party is talking to itself or talking to the country. Jill Mortimer is duly elected. Congratulations. <laughs> It was just after seven this morning when Hartlepool fell to the Conservatives, with their share of the vote rising almost a quarter and Labour's dropping nine percent. Voters who backed the Brexit party last time went for Boris Johnson's party. I'm immensely proud to be the first Conservative MP in Hartlepool for 57 years. Happy Tories in Northumberland, where they took control of the council. Sad Labour in Dudley, where the Conservatives took an extra 12 seats. And in Harlow, the Blues were cheering and Labour was miserable. We've lost too many caring and compassionate councillors who have worked so hard for their communities. But I'm afraid we've been overwhelmed by national events. Not so much disappointment from one of Labour's left-wing trade union paymasters as an I told you so. All of our people are telling us, well, what, what are we voting for? What does Labour stand for? And that's really the issue that Keir himself has to come to terms with. Is Len Petoskey right about why Keir Starmer didn't impress? We asked Midlands voters. He's like a piece of wood, aren't he? Cardboard cutout is awful. I just think we're so far removed from the working class and the aspirations of the working class. Lots of faith, isn't it? local politicians, as well as the ones in Westminster. Houchin, Ben, the Conservative Party candidate, 121,964. The re-elected Tory mayor, with three times Labour's vote in a mayoral contest that Labour thought till recently it had a chance to win. Houchin knew... This is so effective compared to that one. And this government has done a huge amount for Teesside, it absolutely needs to do more, more Boris, so if you're listening, I'll be knocking on your door. The measure of the Tories lead in Hartlepool and much of England. He's enjoying it, and although he will know that in politics the end is always failure, his lead over Labour means that end is probably years away. Robert Peston, News of 10. So, clearly a difficult day for Labour across England. Here's how things stand tonight with the results so far. More results are, of course, expected tomorrow. Conservatives are the biggest winner with 1,153, up 160. Labour are down 173, also down, and the Greens are up. Those results mean the Conservatives have 31 councils, up 8. Labour have 32, down 4, with 12 under no overall control. And then there is that significant by-election in Hartlepool where the Conservatives won the seat from Labour, polling more than 50% of the vote. And that really is a remarkable result. It's not that long since Labour's Peter Mandelson commanded a majority of 17 and a half thousand there. Well, today he said the defeat boiled down to the two seats, Covid and Corbyn. But across no the infections at all. Bees, which are just as important, Boris Johnson and Brexit. They drew voters away from Labour in 2019 that simply have not come back. So what needs to change for Labour to regain a foothold in its former heartland? A new dawn for Labour, but not one they'd ever dreamed of. Rejected in a seat that had been red for more than half a century. Their candidate's anti-Brexit stance in a Brexit voting town seen by some as tone deaf. Right, Ian Cordy runs a food bank and has always voted Labour, but says they'd lost touch. We didn't listen. Uh, the party didn't listen. And...